Well, good morning again. Let's uh, let's open our Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter fourteen. We're going to begin there in, in verse fourteen and, um, and and make our way down to to verse twenty this morning. There's looks like something black exploded up here. I have no idea what's going on. Um, this is all over everything. Um, title of the message this morning, if you notice as you you walked in this morning, is. Uh, is maybe one that we we've never maybe never really truly considered. Maybe it's one that we've never even really heard of. But the the, the title is Jesus reaps the earth, and um, it, it's, it's it's important that we we understand this part of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'll get to more of that um, as we're going to look at, at verse fourteen here in a moment. But uh, let, let's stand uh, as we honor the reading of God's holy, perfect, and errant word this morning, Revelation chapter fourteen. Beginning in verse 14, the scripture says this, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, So put your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he, then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put... In your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, Lord, first of all, do praise you because you are the King of Kings. And you are the Lord of Lords. And Lord, I pray that this morning we would have a full understanding of the second part of the Trinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we, we look at your second coming here in the book of Revelation, Lord, you are, you are coming in power. You are coming in majesty. You are coming in might. You are coming to judge the earth. Lord, I pray that this morning... It, Lord, you would take this word and, Lord, did you would impress it into our hearts. Maybe we're here this morning and we only have a half understanding of Jesus. To us, Jesus is just love. Jesus is just mercy. Yes, He is those things, but He is so much more. We don't understand Jesus as being the Jesus of wrath. The Jesus of judgment. The Jesus who is going to come and reap the earth. Lord, I pray that you would give us a, a full knowledge so that we would have a better understanding of how we praise you, how we worship you, how we respond to who you are and, and what you've said, how we dedicate our, our, our lives to, to you. Yes, as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, but yes, Lord, also as the one who comes to harvest the earth. Lord, I pray that this morning, Lord, if there's anyone, because of their failure to, 
accept that gracious gift of salvation. They don't know Jesus as their Savior, but Lord, I pray that this morning, if things do not change, they will know Jesus as their harvester. But Lord, it's, it's not too late. It's not too late to turn in repentance to You. Lord, we still have opportunity before this time comes. And Lord, I pray that we would redeem the day. Lord, I, I thank You for the hard truth of Your Word. It's easy for us to, to preach and to share it. A Jesus that just loves everybody, but it's more difficult to speak about the Jesus who's going to come and judge those who have rejected Him. But both truths need to be heard and understood. Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us a heart to know this morning. Lord, I pray that You would just use me in a, in a, in a mighty way, Lord, so that You will get all the credit, You will get all the glory. So that your people will walk out of here saying that they have truly heard from the word of God. Lord, we love you. And we give you everything that is due your holy name. All power. All glory. All majesty. All rule and dominion. Forever and ever. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to begin there in verse 14, and we're going to take a look at, at the harvester. Again, <clears throat> verse 14 says, Then I looked, and behold, now it's interesting, every time John does this throughout our, our, our book of Revelation, he's drawing our attention to somewhere else. And it, usually he is drawing our attention to either the Lord Jesus Christ himself or something that Jesus is going to initiate. And sometimes it's, a, it's judgment that is brought um, by one of the angels, but it's always initiated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here he says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Well, the one with the sharp sickle in his hand is Jesus, right? There, there, there's no other explanation that, that can even possibly be understood here other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to ask you to answer this out loud, but kind of answer it to yourself. Before this morning... Have you ever had a picture of Jesus coming with a sickle in His hand? We usually don't. That's not the image that we have of Jesus. Uh, a lot of times we, we, we have this image of, of kind of the, 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 the meek Jesus, but this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The biggest cue there is the title of one like the Son of Man. Again, this title taken directly from, look with me in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, verses 13 and 14. Daniel's vision of the pre-incarnate Christ as Jesus coming to the earth. He says, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up from the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. The vision that Daniel has is not the vision of, a, of just an earthly king. It's the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, how do you know? Because he stands before God coming from the Ancient of Days. I've said before as we've studied that, that phrase literally means from eternity past. In other words, no beginning, no end. There's only one that, dis, that uh, fulfills that description, and that's Jesus. But it goes on, he says, He stands before Him, stands before the Lord, and was given to Him a kingdom and a dominion. And right, He, he was given, and He received glory and honor. Those things that have only been given to Jesus. People from every 
tribe, tongue, nation will bow down and worship Him. All things we've seen fulfilled in, in, in the book of, of Revelation so far. And His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And His dominion will, will never perish and never fade away. And there's only one that fulfills that, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' favorite title for Himself was Son of Man. Um, I believe every time that Jesus spoke that, not only was He looking back to the prophecy of Daniel and reminding every time those, those people heard that, that I am the fulfillment of, of what Daniel saw, but I think He's also looking forward to this day when, when Jesus will come and, and, and reap the earth. That even in His first coming, Jesus is always making allusion to His second coming. But it is so important that we have a complete view of Jesus. I, I said, how many of us had this type, this view of Jesus in our minds before we came here this morning? And uh, without having anyone answer, I would probably say very, very little of us. Um, and if we do, maybe it's just for a time, for a, for a fleeting moment. Quite often our view of Jesus, our understanding of Jesus is many times limited to His, His first coming. But... It's important that we have a complete view of Jesus because if we don't, we have an incomplete theology. Right? If it's just the first coming Jesus, if Jesus is just mercy and grace and, and love and, 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 and the cross and, and those things, and, that, and that's the only thing that we ever see, we have an incomplete view of Jesus. And it leads to an incomplete theology. It's the first coming of Jesus was one of humble nature. He came as a servant. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to sow the seeds of the gospel. Paul writes it like this in, in Philippians chapter 2. Verses 6 through 8. Describing the first coming of Christ. He says, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Yeah, yes, that is what Jesus did in his first coming. That, that, is, that is part of who he is, but that's not all of who he is. And, and if our, our understanding, our, our view of Jesus is just this meek, humble servant who never who's never going to get angry about anything, who is kind of ran over by the Jewish authorities, is kind of ran over by the, by the Roman officials. There's a, a view of Jesus that a lot of people have that Je Jesus is he's just kind of this, this meek guy and all he does is go around and washes people's feet. That's not all of who Jesus is. I said that having a, an incomplete view of, of Jesus leads to an incomplete theology. Um, the Jesus that we fail to recognize is the Jesus of His second coming. Because that is just a partial view of Jesus. His second coming, He comes as a sovereign King. He, he will come in power and majesty. He, he will come to judge the living and the dead. And He will come to reap the earth. That is the, the complete picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we worship Him, we are not just worshiping the meek, humble Jesus that came to seek and, and, and to serve, but we're also worshiping the, the powerful, almighty Jesus who's going to come and judge the living and the dead, who's going to, who's going to reap um, with His sickle over the entire earth. I'll give you an example of this. Um, when, uh, well, matter of fact, with uh, Andrew was here last week, and uh, I went to Italy with him on, on that mission trip. He was actually my roommate the entire time. And we went into um, we went into a lot of different uh, churches, cathedrals, um, and, and, and we noticed there was a common theme. Of course, they all have beautiful art. 
um, you know, paintings and, and murals and statues and all those things. But there was a common theme, and it didn't matter which city we were in, um, didn't matter the, the size of the structure we were in or who it was dedicated to, whether it was in Rome or, or whether it was in, uh, in, in Sicily, or it, it, it didn't matter. But there was a common theme to all of the art and architecture that, that we saw there. Picture Jesus one of two ways. Either Jesus was a baby, um, usually being held by, by Mary, or Jesus was hanging on the cross surrounded sometimes by disciples sometimes by Mary and the, and the other other women and they were kind of looking looking upon him like and, and it was just like he was helpless he was pictured as either a helpless baby or helplessly hanging on the cross well it's not only an incomplete view of Jesus that leads to an incomplete theology of Jesus Right? Jesus isn't just, just Jesus needs our, our help or Jesus needs Mary's help or Jesus needs his disciples' help or, you know, and somehow that Jesus just kind of kind of brought us part of salvation and we need to step in and, and kind of help Jesus. And, you know, we may not say that, but if our mind doesn't go to the second coming of Jesus, right? If we don't understand Jesus coming in power and authority, how are we going to believe in 2019 that Jesus has power and authority over our own lives? It's the idea of, well, Jesus kind of made a way for me to salvation, but I kind of got to work all these things out myself. No, you absolutely don't. Jesus did not stay a baby. Jesus did not stay hanging on that cross. Jesus didn't even stay dead in that tomb, but he rose victorious three days later, proving his power over sin, death, and the grave. We need to have the understanding of Jesus as the harvester as well, coming to reap and judge the earth. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaking of his second coming, Matthew 24, beginning in verse 27. He says, for just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. He describes it here to the flashing of lightning. Does anyone see lightning flash from the sky and think, ah, oh, that's, that's kind of a humble, meek um, display of light? Oh, I want to go and touch that. No. We were, uh, we were, we were standing in the garage. I think Kelly, Kelly was with me. Um, it was maybe me, you, and Arzo. I can't remember. We were standing in the garage, and um, it wasn't even raining yet, but it was getting ready to. And lightning struck probably about 15 feet from where we were standing. There was nothing meek about that, right? Jesus describes his second coming as, as lightning flashing across the sky. Um, verse 28, he says, Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great power and glory. You know what Jesus is describing here? Exactly what John is seeing here in Revelation 14. This is, this is bringing fear to everyone living on the earth because Jesus is coming to judge. Verse 31, and He will send out forth His angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one into the sky to the other. His coming will cause the tribes of the earth to mourn because the harvester is coming. Secondly, this morning, not only do we see the harvester as being Jesus himself, secondly, we see the, the hour. Verses 15 and 16. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. 
because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. God's wrath comes on God's time. I, I, I want to I say that again. God's wrath comes on God's time. This is all happening according to God's timetable. But there is an hour when the ministry of grace and mercy is over and judgment will begin. Do, do, do you notice here that there, there's no delay, right? There's, there's no hesitation in, in, in what's going on. Jesus appears on the cloud, the sharp sickle in his hand. Immediately an angel comes out of the temple and cries out with a loud voice and says, Put your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. When the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ comes, it comes right now. There's no, hold on a second, there's no, wait, I never had an opportunity. I still want to repent. I still need, the, 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 the day is over. It, it should lead to this sense of, of urgency. One of, the, one of the biggest misleadings that Satan is able to, to do is to tell us we got all the time in the world. I hear it all the time, and it comes in different ways. Young people say, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get right with Jesus when I get older. I, I even have people look me straight in the face, man, I, I just want to live and, and, and have fun and, and, and party for a while, and then I'll, then I'll start thinking about those things. But when the judgment of Jesus comes, it's too late. Or young married people say, well, we, we just want to have kids. And then, you know, once our kids get a little older, then, then, we'll, then we'll start thinking about those things. This idea that we have all the time in the world. Well, we do have time. But there will come a time when we won't have time. And we do not know when that hour will be. So it should lead to this sense of, of urgency. Every time that we, that we hear the gospel and we ignore it, we're, we're putting time closer to this time when there will be no more time. And it will only be judgment. There's no hesitation. The hour is coming when the opportunity to repent is no more. Jesus speaks of His coming judgment. See, this isn't something like just kind of came out of the blue. Like all of a sudden we get the revelation. We're like, whoa, Jesus didn't see any of that coming. He speaks of it. Look in, look in John chapter 5. Verses 22 through 27. Jesus says, for not even the Father judges anyone, but has given all judgment to the Son. Now, this, this is Jesus speaking as early on in His ministry. He's already talking about judgment. Uh, you, we even go back to, to John chapter 3, where, where He's talking about salvation. And He said, you know, whosoever believes in, in, in the Son has eternal life, but whoever has, has not believed has been judged already, has been judged already. By Jesus, according to Jesus. Jesus is not even the Father judges anyone, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. For he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. We, we, we avoid judgment through the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, believing him who sent me, believing God's own testimony, about Jesus, believing Jesus' own word about Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There, there, there's no back door. There's no side door. There's no three or four entrances into heaven. There's one. And when you forsake that one, there's nothing left but judgment. Jesus says in 25 there, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
An hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself. And He gave Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. There it is again. Jesus using that Son of Man, not just pointing back to Daniel, but pointing forth to of Him coming in judgment. So if our, our idea is that, well, you know, Jesus is just this meek, humble servant, and He's going to give me all the time in the world. Because it's, it's what He does, right? He loves us so much, He's just going to give us chance after chance after chance, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And on one hand, He, he, he gives us more than we deserve. If you've heard the gospel one times more than what we deserve, but yet he, he gives us time and time, sermon and sermon, scripture and scripture, but there will come an hour when Jesus will come to judge. Look back in, in, in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 35. Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So if you're hoping this is like, okay, Jesus is going to kind of change his mind on this, this, this whole exclusivity thing and this whole judgment thing and this whole, you know, we're only going to find eternal life in, in his name and in that saving relationship with him. No, ain't happening. His word will not pass away. It will never change. It is eternal. Verse 36, he says, But of that day and that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. He hearkens back to the, to the days of Noah. Um, what, what, what was Noah instructed to do? Noah was instructed... Well, yeah, he was instructed to, to build a, a, a big boat um, in, in a time when it had never rained in the middle of a desert. Um, but more important, he was instructed to go and preach a message. To preach a message of repentance. And yet, what, was the, what, what were the people saying? When's this judgment coming? He preached his message for 300 years. When, when's this, when's this so-called rain coming, this flood? When, when is God going to judge us? And they were just living their life because there, there was no sense that God would actually do what God had promised to do. But yet for 300 years, God showed mercy and grace. We're in a period now of over 2,000 years. God has shown mercy and grace. But an hour is coming, Jesus says. An hour is coming. He says, and it will be like the days of Noah. Uh, verse 38, he says, For in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Right up until that hour, they were going along like life. We're doing our own thing. We're having a good time. We're enjoying life. It's about this judgment of God. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. And when Noah entered the ark, you know who shut that door? God Himself. And it was too late. Jesus says, my coming will be like that day. Verse 39, He says, And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. They're just going about their everyday business. Saying, God hasn't done anything to me yet. What makes you think He will? And then the day of judgment came. And then it was too late. But God is 
urging us. Don't wait. Don't wait until you get older. Don't wait until you, you get things straightened out in your life. Don't, don't wait until... I, the, the, I think the, the second biggest thing that people have an excuse for not accepting Christ. Well, I still have questions. And? You, you don't think I, I have questions? You, you don't think there are things in the Bible that I don't understand? That God just says, hey, you're just going to have to trust me on this, big guy. Um, I'm, I'm a lot smarter than you. You can't understand totally how I operate things, but somehow we allow that to be this obstacle that it's somehow this, this righteous obstacle. I still have questions. And when God answers every one of my questions, then I will consider that. How prideful is that? There will be a day. But until then, And we need to act with this sense of urgency to the church. Now, come church, we're, we're not getting off scot-free here. If there's anyone who acts like we got all the time in the world, it's the church. Right? We act like we have all the time in the world to, to witness and to evangelize and, 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 and to spread the word and to grow in our relationship with Christ. But no, there should be this sense of urgency with us as well. That, that, that we, should, we should want to, to, to have a, a deeper, richer theology. Who, who wants to get to heaven and they're singing songs and we're like, I have no idea what that's about. I, I never learned that. When, when are we going to get back to Jesus loves me, this I know? That's the only thing that I learned on my time on earth. No, we, we want to have a rich vocabulary of theology, a richer, deeper worship of God here right now. But there will come an hour when our opportunities to be the church are no more. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul not only understood that the message that he preached needed to be responded to with a sense of urgency, but, but he carried out his own ministry with this sense of, of urgency. But he, he, he gives this, this plea out here. In, in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, And working together with him, that's Paul's ministry, our ministry, working together with Christ, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. There's two ways that we can do that. We can receive the grace of God in vain by hearing the gospel by, and, and, and rejecting it. But we can also receive the grace of God in vain by accepting His salvation and acting like that's all there is to it. Not growing in sanctification. Not maturing as, as, as a Christian. Then Paul quotes from the Old Testament here. Verse 2, he says, For he says, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The, the, the idea that there is an hour coming when, when, when the reaping will begin, and there's, there's no, going to be no time in between. There's not going to be a hold on. There's not going to be a redo. There's not going to be a second chance in, in purgatory. That, there's just, that's just not scriptural. That idea should lead to the sense of urgency that I need to respond to the gospel message for salvation. But I also need to keep responding to the gospel message for my sanctification. Thirdly this morning. Not only do we see the harvester and the hour, but we see the harvest. Um, now, I kind of want to give you a, an idea of kind of what's going on here. Um, not, not everything that we see in Revelation is, is chronologically in order. Um, sometimes we'll look at some things that are happening in chronological order, and then all of a sudden John will get a vision, and it will be more of, a, of an overarching theme here and that's these these judgments these two judgments happen at, at two different times um, the grain harvest as verses 14 and 16 are often called um, 
is referred to as the, the judgment that comes upon the earth by the, by the hand of Jesus. Um, some liken that to the, um, to the harvest of, of wheat and tares. I, I think we can kind of see a piece of that. Um, but I don't think that fully fits in. I, I think the, the, the wheat and the tares is, is, again, even a longer, broader thing. Because, uh, you know, the, the parable of the wheat and tares where, you know, the, the, the tares grow in among the wheat. Um, tares are a weed that looks like a wheat. And Jesus says, don't, don't pull them up by the root. He says, but the harvest time, they, they, they will, you know, they'll be harvested. Um, well, during the time of tribulation, especially after chapter 13, with the mark of the beast and, and the worship of the image and those things, tares aren't going to look like weed anymore. Um, so I think the harvest of the wheat is, is the major harvest is at the, at the rapture. Um, but yet we do see the, the eventual harvest of the, of the tares. Um, but yet this is the judgment that comes upon the earth by the hand of Jesus. And it's more than just what's happening at, at, at one moment. I, I think it's all the judgments that we've seen so far through the book of Revelation. Look in just a couple places. Look in uh, Revelation chapter 6 verse 1. Remember, we began the series of judgments with the breaking of the seals, and we had the seven seals of judgments that were broken. Verse 1 says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, Come. So here we have Jesus initiating the first set of judgments. Look over in chapter 8, verse 1. Remember, the seventh seal leads to the seven trumpets of judgment. He says, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Um, so verses 14 through 16 are often called the, the grain harvest. Or verses 17 through 20 are called the grape harvest. And as we read that, you, you kind of understand why. Verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. So this judgment is different from the judgment of Christ because this is now being um, initiated by an angel uh, coming out of the temple. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out of, from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sickle and gather the cluster from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. The judgment of the grape harvest is a depiction of that final battle of Armageddon, of God's final judgment upon all evil. The, 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 the grain wrath was just Jesus' um, judgment upon the earth, where this, is, this goes beyond just physical judgment on the earth. This is spiritual judgment as well. And I, I'm not going to get to a, a spoiler of that, but uh, the, the angel who has power over fire, um, the battle of Armageddon is not really much of a battle. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it um, We'll get to it in, in a few chapters, but uh, just keep, keep that in the back of your mind there. The, the angel that has power over fire, because that's all it takes for God to finally destroy all the evil um, at, the, at, at the battle of, of Armageddon. Um, but this is God's final judgment upon all evil. Um, again, the final battle is not much of a battle, but again, there's no delay in this harvest no hesitation, just total devastation. And, and the imagery there is putting the grapes into the, into the vat. Um, you've probably seen, if you've seen like, like older movies, especially if they're set in Europe, um, they would put the, the grapes in a, in a large barrel looking thing, and they would literally stomp them. Um, and there would be a, like a trough coming out of that where the, the juice would just flow from. This is the, 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 the picture of, of this, this final judgment of God. 
It's a fulfillment of Joel chapter 3. Turn with me there. Joel chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 17. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Now, now this, is so, this is so typical of the character and nature of God. He's getting ready to describe His wrath, but He begins it with this call to, to repentance. There, there is there's so much grace in, even in the Old Testament when God is getting ready to declare His wrath, yet He preempts it with His grace. There's still an opportunity. He says, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord. Um, well, am I in the wrong? Am I in the wrong chapter? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Chapter 3. But we can't get to chapter 3 without going into chapter 2. Um, it all flows. Verse 12. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle and the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon grow dark. The stars lose their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for His people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. doesn't change what I said, just comes at the end of it, but we still see, again, the, the, what God's objective is, even in wrath, is a recognition that, that He is our Lord. He is our God. He is our refuge. He is our stronghold. He is our strength. In other words, if, it's, if it weren't for the Lord Jesus Christ, we would never be able to stand under His judgment. Look in Revelation chapter 19. Again, we see a, for further, a further fulfillment of, of John's vision here of, of this judgment of, of God just beginning this is just the beginning stages in Revelation 19 verses 15 through and 16 this is the description of Jesus here it says and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What is it that, that God wants us to do with this? It has to be more than just a, an appreciation of Jesus coming and, and, and judging the earth. It has to be more than just a head knowledge of these things. If this vision of Jesus doesn't move us in one direction or the other, we need to check our spiritual pulse. This is the same Jesus who says, follow me. This is the same Jesus who says, take up your cross daily and come after me. This is the same Jesus who, who yes, who, who suffered, who was nailed to a cross. 
and who died. And this is the same Jesus who rose again and who ascended to the right hand of God the Father. Same Jesus that is returning in power and might and majesty. This is the same Jesus that we follow. This is the same Jesus that we worship. This is the same Jesus who is calling out to us, begging us, if you will, come. Come and, and, and receive the promises of eternal life, the promises of redemption, the promises of sanctification, the promises of, of a God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The promise of a God who says, even though through the midst of, of the hardest times of your life, that you will be able to rejoice knowing that I'm going to be glorified in this. That this is the same Jesus that should cause us to, to, to fall to our knees and, and to praise Him and, and to worship Him. It's the same Jesus who, who calls us as a church to, to be His mission. To go and, and to share our, our testimonies. This is the same Jesus that says, I can transform your lives. Same Jesus who says, I can snatch you from the eternal fires of hell. And He says, come to me. But if you refuse, Jesus will come and He will reap. I want to read a quote. Um, sometimes things have been said in such a way you can never improve on it, um, which is anything that I have to say is, can be said better. Um, but I want to read to you the, the conclusion of Charles Spurgeon's sermon when he preached this very text. He says, I beseech you, do not risk that doom for yourselves. Escape for your lives. Look not behind, but fly to the only refuge which God has provided. Whoever will entrust his soul to Jesus Christ shall be eternally saved. Look unto Him who wore the thorn crown and repose your soul's entire confidence in Him. And then, in that last great day, you shall see Him seated on the white cloud, wearing the golden crown, and you shall be gathered. But if you reject Him, do not think it wrong that you should be cast with the grapes into the winepress of the wrath of God and be trodden with the rest of the clusters of the vine of the earth. I beg you to take Christ as your Savior this very hour, lest this night you should die unsaved. Lay hold of Jesus, lest you never hear another gospel invitation or warning. If I have seemed to speak terribly... God knoweth that I have done it out of love to your souls. And believe me, that I do not speak as strongly as the truth might well permit me to do. For there is something far more terrible about the doom of the lost than language can ever express or thought conceive. God save you all from ever suffering that doom. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. If you think this is too strong, I agree with Spurgeon. It's not strong enough. Words cannot describe what eternal damnation looks like for those who have rejected the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, There's a, another gospel invitation. Another opportunity if you were here this morning. And you've never surrendered your heart, your soul, your life, your future, your eternity. If you've never surrendered that to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's another opportunity. You can see Jesus coming on that cloud with that golden crown on His head and not be trembling in fear like the rest of the earth, but praising and worshiping the King of kings 
and the Lord of Lords. Do, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior this morning? When we stand and have our song of invitation, I, I know of no greater expression of what God is, is, is doing in our hearts and lives than responding in an invitation and coming and praying. I, I would love to pray with you about that. But I even urge you, don't, don't wait till then. If God is so moving in your heart right now, that this is something that you know needs to be done, I, I, I pray you do it right now. There is that sense of urgency. There should be that sense of urgency. But I also want to offer an invitation to the church this morning. Why do we act like we got all the time in the world? I'm guilty of it. We act like we can just do our own thing for as long as we want to do our own thing. And then somehow on our timing, we'll do what we know is right to do. But God says it, it doesn't work that way. Of that hour, no man knows. Not the angels, not even the Son, but the Father alone. Jesus only don't know because Jesus don't want to know. We don't know. And, and maybe understanding that Jesus is going to come and reap the earth, that very well means people that we love, people that we speak to each and every day. What's going to cause us to move with a sense of urgency? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I... Lord, I, I entrust the Word of God to the Spirit of God this morning. Lord, I have done the best that I could possibly do. But Lord, I need you to do more. Lord, I can never scare anyone into salvation. I can never argue anyone into being saved. But Lord, I know the Holy Spirit can move and can convict. Lord, I pray for that to happen right now. Lord, I, I, I pray for a faithful response to the gospel. Lord, I also pray for the faithful feet of, of your church. Scripture says, how beautiful are the feet who shod the, the gospel of peace. Lord, the church is your army. It needs to take the word of God. And go get in the battle. Because our general has commanded us to do so. Lord, I pray that this, this invitation would be different. Our response would be different than maybe what it is every single week. Lord, I turn it over to you. Use it according to your providential will. And we will glorify and magnify the name of Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.